Good evening, everyone. We are continuing on our journey in this chapter of the Psalms, uh, chapter 119. And today we will be looking at some very familiar verses. And let's begin by looking at verse 9. As we have seen yesterday, this particular psalm has sections divided by the Aleph Bet, the Hebrew alphabets. Yesterday, we covered chapter 119, verses 1 to 8. And every verse starts with the Aleph. Now, for today, if you want to take a look, you can see that the verses from 9 to 16, 9 to 16, all starts with a bet. As you can see here, there's a bet. Verse 10, it starts with a bet. 11 starts with a bet. 12 starts with a bet. 13 starts with a bet. And it goes on 14, 15, and 16. By the time we get to verse 17, it is now a gimel. And so we will stop at verse 16 because of the sections. And if you recall what we said yesterday, the Psalms itself, at least from where we are standing in verses uh, 1 to 8, 9 to 16, each of the section is written with words, uh, with sentences that begins with the Aleph Bet. And in a poetic style, we call it an acrostic psalm. And so we begin with the letter Bet today, which is the second letter in verse 9. Now, one thing we need to remember when we deal with the Hebrew Psalms, and we call it poetry, it is not like contemporary poetry. It is not like Shakespeare. It is not like Milton or Keats. Um, they, they are not purposely just written with acrostic and, uh, and, and occasionally with uh, different Hebraic styles. But the intent of writing it this way is to help the reader remember and memorize some of these instructions that is written in a more poetic style. And in so doing, it is different from our modern day poetry in that it consists of real instructions. It is not just flowery language. And so there is no poetic license in Hebrew poetry to just write things in abstract form just for the flowery words to be used to rhyme. So in Hebrew poetry, they use this to read in the temple, uh, in liturgy. And so it comprises of really distinct instructions, as we have seen in the first eight verses. Today we begin in verse 9, it says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. Now on the screen, we have the New American Standard Bible in the English translation. The black text uh, and, and the italic text, uh, you find it that uh, they are inserted by... Um, the, the, the translators to help the English reader uh, figure out uh, in a more English style writing. So let's break down verse 9. It says, how can? How can literally means in what way? It is not just how can. In our, in our modern day expression, we would want to know, how do we do that, right? How do we do that? In what way? What is the mechanism? That is what this phrase actually means. And it refers to a young man, any young man. 
And the, the word here, young man, uh, I would think it would be in the, in the teens or probably in the late teens onwards. Uh, and, and that is how the Hebrew uh, considers uh, a na'ar, a, a, a young man. Uh, we're not talking about somebody in the 30s and 40s. Like in modern day, you could still join a youth a political party when you are in your 40s. Uh, but in this case, you will find that um, the young man is really the, the teenager, if you want to say that. Uh, you find this word very prevalent when we were studying the book of Proverbs. We're talking about my son, my son. It's about a young man. And so how can this young man, when he begins life in this world, uh, he is considered uh, uh, one with, with responsibility, with, uh, with acumen to, to make decisions. How can he keep his way pure? The word here uh, a, is, is really to say, to, to make clean. Right? It, it means to make clean, keep pure. Keep pure means to make clean, um, to be innocent, make his way clean, and really to be pure, right? Be pure. Uh, ceremonially pure, morally pure, uh, to, to really be purified. These are all very Hebrew terms about purity. Uh, we, we need we, we shouldn't think of purity in modern day sense. Uh, how does one keep um, his life, his way means, his conduct? Uh, and this one, the, the way is actually the well-trodden way. And this refers to his conduct. Uh, how he conducts his life. How do you keep it pure in the eyes of God? How can you keep it clean in the eyes of God? That, that's what it means. And so Psalm 119 is not talking about general anyone uh, in the world, but very much a young man in the eyes of God, before God. And this is a rhetorical question. In what way? How do you actually make sure that a young man... Uh, Keep his conduct pure. Keep his conduct uh, clear. Keep his conduct clean in the eyes of God. And the secret is in the answer. The word keep is to guard. Guard his walk. To guard his way. According to your word. Psalm 9 keeps talking about God's words, God's precepts, his statutes, his testimonies, um, his commands. Well, every time you see all this, they are all synonyms. It's what God has spoken to Moses, to the Israelites, and that's retained in the word of God. And in their terms, um, you would call it his law, his Torah. And so the way that a young man, as he walks in life in his way, he keeps it pure by guarding it with the Torah. Your word. And how would he know your word or the word of God? Is by studying it, by knowing it. And, and that is how it's done, and which means that it is very intentional. It is not by accident. I guess you could say in verse 9. Uh, verse 9 is giving us a picture of how do we make sure the young man uh, is not distracted. If you recall when we were studying the book of Proverbs, there's always this woman out there who is calling the young man and to misstep and to walk away from God. And then there is this other woman called wisdom 
who tries to keep him in check. And that would be the word of God. Now, this is exactly the same way chapter 119 is expressing itself. How can a, a, a young boy uh, maintain purity in life? Purity by God's standards, not by our social standards. Purity under the commands and laws of God. Well, it says by guarding it, by making sure you observe carefully and closely and intentionally according to God's words. Which tells us this. If we don't know God's words, there's nothing much to keep pure, isn't it? And if we want to know what is purity, it needs to be by the standards and measurement of God. And hence, this really talks about uh, the relationship between God and man. And in this case, framed in the life of a young boy. God's intent of giving us Psalm 119 and in saying it in 170 different ways is to impress on us how important is the word of God. And I don't think we would deny that. But also in 170 over ways, explaining to us how we are to do that. To maintain a good relationship with God requires us to know God and to know God by his word. And if we guard our lives by his word, it means that we are intentionally focusing on our conduct and guarding our conduct by God's words. We need to know God's words and we need to use it to guard our ways. And that's how this verse is read. It is not by accident. We do not accidentally say, oh, oh that must be God's word. It doesn't work that way. And so as we are reading this verse today, I, I believe it is to speak to us to pay attention to God's words, that we need to learn it, we need to study it, we need to know it, otherwise we would not know how to use it. And so verse 9 is to tell us how to use God's word to guard the ways of the young man. Now in verse 10, a very familiar verse. Verse 10 reads this. With all my heart, I have sought you. Do not let me wander from your commandments. The idea here is very close to verse 9. If you want to keep your way pure, it means do not wander away, right? Do not wander away. So let's break this down. He says, with all, now understand heart means mind, right? With every fiber of our mind. So heart literally says, we're talking about the mind and it talks about our decisions, our choices that we make. So we're not talking about a love story, an abstract form of say, it's in our heart. And it's not the organ heart. It's the abstract concept that we make choices with our mind. We make decisions. And so it says with every decision I make, with all the choices I make, I have sought you to, to inquire and seek with care is to seek to find. It is to seek to know so that the choices we make is actually based on the word of God. And that's what the psalmist is saying. With all my mind, with all my heart, I seek you with, with great care. And so they study the word of God. They, they learn the word of God in great care so that you can keep your way pure. And so it says here, Do not let me wander from your commandments. Requires us to 
to understand it this way. It says here, do not let me wander. The word wander really means to, to go astray. Let me just put it here. The word wander, right? It means to go astray. Don't let me go astray. Don't let me err unintentionally. And so the psalmist is saying, yes, I am searching and studying your word, God, so that my decisions are always uh, very consistent with your words. However, there is this element of unintentional errors that without purpose, I might sidestep. And that is what verse 10 is saying. With all my heart, I am seeking you. I am wanting to do what you want me to do, but don't even let me go astray. Don't let me even make the slightest mistake, even accidentally, even unintentionally, uh, 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 away from what you have commanded. So what has God commanded? His words. You see? Verse 9 and 10 gives you the same aspect of a different, slightly different nuance. How can we keep our way pure? How can we make sure we do not err from God's commands? How can we make sure we do not go astray from God's commands? And, and, and the whole idea here is make sure we use all our hearts, all our minds, all our choices by guarding it according to God's words. That is the only way. And seeking God to help us not even to make the slightest mistake unintentionally. This is the attitude, I would say, that the, the psalmist is, I, I should say, is representing the mind of the reader, us today. As we call upon God and seek God with such a, an attitude that we want to make sure we are walking right before God. You see, if we, are, if we don't care about how we walk before God, Psalms 119 have no meaning to us. So the, the, the assumption I think we can make or we must make is that as we study Psalm 119 is that we want to have a good relationship with God, a right relationship with God to do what God wants us to do. And that must be the, the, the assumption, the presumptions as we approach this text. And so it says, with all my heart, I have sought you. Uh, and do not let me make any unintentional mistakes. That is the attitude. Completeness in focus. Now comes to verse 11, a very familiar verse. It says, your word, I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. Now, this is quite an interesting phrase, verse 11. Have I treasured in my heart? And this is a very good translation, I must say, in, in the New America. Standard. So let us, it says this, um, what God what God has said. So it is not just anything, you know, your word, I as the as the uh, psalmist is saying. Uh, usually we would read the word treasured as hidden. And it does mean both. So let me explain this. The word hidden in my heart means to treasure. What it means is to hide as if very precious. That is the concept. To conceal, to ensure you 
do not forget. That, that is what this word treasure actually means. So the, the psalmist is saying, I am hiding your word, God. I am keeping it as very precious. I am keeping it so that I do not forget what you have said in my heart. Now, this is interesting because remember, the word heart is mind. And so it is hidden in the heart, which is the mind. And, and we might say, well, it's deep inside and nobody can see it. But that is not quite the meaning here. Remember, the mind is the, the, the seat of making choices, making decisions, which means that, that this, the word that, the word that is in order that, right? In order that. It's not such a straightforward, with the intent. So the, the whole purpose of hiding as the treasure in our heart, so we don't forget, the word of God is treated that way. So that in all our choices and decisions that we make, we do not sin against God. So choices can lead one to sin or not to sin. That is what it means. It doesn't mean we just memorize and let it stick there. And if you can memorize about a thousand words, if we keep it in our heart, it is not about treasure hiding, I would say. Say, so if you have a gold bar in your house and you are to hide it, you will want to hide it in a very safe place, but in a place that you will always remember where it is. You do not want to hide a gold bar and you forget where you hide it. And that is what it means. Uh, you hide it so that you do not forget it. And that in our actions, in our daily actions, in our choices or decisions, we do not miss against God. Now that the word khatat, sin, literally means miss. Now what does that mean? It means that when God says one, two, three, it looks like a, a, a piece of, I would say, a, a recipe book, if you want to treat that way. You can use an illustration of a recipe book. If we are to make a, a, an exquisite dish, there are instructions that is given, you know, a cup of this, a, a teaspoon of that, a, a pinch of this and that. And thereby, when you follow the instructions, you should come out with the dish. However, if you miss one or two of these list of ingredients, the Hebrew concept says that you have sinned against God. You have missed the mark. You did not fulfill all the ingredients to put into your life. And when you miss some of these ingredients, it means that some of these elements would not be complied to. And hence the word sin. That's what sin actually means. To, to miss, to miss what God has said. And so the only way not to miss God's uh, desire of us, of what God expects of us, is to make sure that we hide it so you know how many gold bars you still have. You don't want to hide it so that you, instead of having 10 gold bars, tomorrow you, you can only find nine. That, that's what sin is, means. You don't miss any point. No. In the Hebrew mind, Missing a point given by God is a serious matter. Now, in, in our example of an ingredient, uh, by missing uh, uh, some ingredient, your cake could turn out to be something else. 
It may look like a cake, but it won't taste like a cake, or it won't it won't have the texture like a cake. And that's what means it means by missing the point, missing the mark. If you treat God's words as gold bars, and in our course of life we forget a couple of things, then it means that we have erred. We have we have made a mistake. It may be unintentional, but it is still called a miss, a sin. You have missed the mark. And that's what it means. And so we fear God. We make sure that every decision we make in our heart is guarded by God's words. And that is what this verse actually means. And then when we come to a close or at least a summary, it says, blessed are you, O Lord. May you be blessed. The word blessed here really means um, good words, pronouns. Because it is God we're talking to. So the good words is to praise God, to say good things about God. It says, God, you are great. God, you are good. So teach me your statutes. This word teach comes from the word learn. We have seen in the first segment yesterday. But in an intensive form, that same word means to teach. And so you are, we are calling on God to teach us his statutes. Now, these are big words. Yesterday, when we talked about statutes, hokmah, is it, that you know, when the parliament um, passes a statute, and the statute will tell us the boundaries boundaries of what can and cannot be done and thereby there are penalties. This is what it means by statutes. So God, teach me your boundaries. So I like the word boundaries better than the word statutes because we, we, we can't we can't rationalize or, or picture what that means. So when we praise God, when you feel the urge to thank God, to, to say good things about God, we are also imploring God to teach us our boundaries so that we do not, what? Sin against you. And so verses 11 and 12 has similar context. When we think about God, we are asking God so that we learn. But the idea here is to teach. God to teach us and we to learn the boundaries. God, tell us your boundaries. Does God have boundaries for our lives? And the answer is yes. You know, statutes, the word so that we walk and guard our lives, the decisions we make, those are boundaries. What God likes and dislikes are is the boundaries that frame our lives so that we may not sin against you. And that's what verse 12 is all about. Verse 13. Verse 13 tells us, with my lips... I have told of all the ordinances of your mouth. Now let's break this down. With my lips, by my lips, by what I say would be a good way of understanding this. With my lips. So I have told, now this word told. The word told here is an intensive word to mean to recount or retell, retell, or to, what should we say, to, to count more exactly. So it is not merely to talk about it, but really to, to be very specific 
very specific of all the ordinances. Now the word justice, okay, the word here is justice. Or what else can we say? The ordinances, the judgments. How God will judge the boundaries. You see, in a boundary, you can stay inside. But the moment you step outside, there is a penalty. And by this penalty, this is called judgment or justice of God. So with my lips, I will always talk about and recount, retell, be more exact about the ordinances, the judgments of your mouth. Now, look at this. The word your mouth, Lord says. And what does this mean? It means this. God says his words. And then with his words, then we will recount. So in order for us to recount, we must know God's words. Isn't it? We cannot recount God's word if we don't know what he has said. And that is also why the Israelites continually remind themselves. They will talk about it. They will teach it. They will read it. And every time they come together, they are, they are always conversing the judgments of God to remind people not to cross the line. That is what verse 13 is saying. Verse 14, in the ancient days, the Israelites displayed joy by jumping around and shouting and, and really lifting their hearts and voices and praising God. In the way and journey of your, uh, how should we say, these are events to recall, right? To recall or to repeat again and again. Now, it means that I have rejoiced in the way of your testimony in the sense that the, the path of what God has been doing all these years. Now, much of what is spoken of in regards to the way is the, the, the manner God has worked. So when we talk about the path, it is the manner God has worked. And testimonies refer to the things that we are to recall, to repeat and talk about it again and again. And by this, God has done many things. And through the feast, through the, um, the, the, the appointments, the Moed, uh, one of the things that God wants the Israelites to remember is very much to, how should we say, to, to always recount, right? To always remember uh, how God has worked. Uh, it is to talk about what God has done in the past. Now, you would find that this might be a bit strange to our modern concept, uh, but it is to reflect on what God has done, like crossing the Red Sea, the, the, the ten plagues in Egypt, how God has taken care of them in the wilderness for 40 years, how their sandals and the clothes on their back never wore out, how God has brought them into the land which is uh, rich, uh, which is filled with milk and honey, uh, how they cross the Jordan. Now, that, these are the things that they are recounting as testimonies. 
and they display joy whenever they repeat it. Now, this is not common in our practice today. That is true. And when you think back as to how God wants them every uh, first month of the year to remember the Passover, it is to recall year in, year out, what God has done for them to establish the Israelites as a nation before God, a holy nation. And the psalmist is saying that this is, this is like me looking at all the gold bars before me because the witness of God is worth that much. And so the witness of God is recorded in the Torah. And that is how the psalmist is now explaining himself. This is important for us to realize that the Israelites always recall what God has done to the nation and for the nation from the time of Moses. Verse 15. I will meditate on your precepts and regard your ways. These are all very abstract terms. So it says, I will meditate. The Bible doesn't talk about meditation, actually. Uh, the Bible is very concerned about uh, pondering. All right? And so let me just explain just as a side here. To ponder is to reflect. And so that would be a more modern way of expressing it. I will reflect on your precepts. I will repeat aloud. And that would be a more Israelite way of pondering. If you recall, if you ever had a chance to look at a, a, an Israelite, uh, when, they, when they recite the word of God, they move around and they, 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 they verbalize the word of God and they repeat it aloud. And that's in, in imagery, it's called pondering over God's precepts, again, man's statutes, right? What God is mandating, he wants it done. And so the psalm is saying, I will ponder over everything you want done and I will regard your way. What do you mean regard your way? The, the idea of regard is to, how should we say, is to, is to pay, well, let me just put down here. To pay close attention so to focus. I know it's a long statement, but this is really what it means. And I will regard your ways literally means that, um, that I, will, I will want to pay attention to focus on what you have done in your in your um, in your path, it, the path of God, right? Uh, how He wants us to walk and where He wants us to go, and and you and you would see that the psalmist here has always been talking about how to conduct our walk, our journey with God, our journey in relationship with God. And it is a constant activity. It is not by accident, as you can see. And in verse 16, ends our segment today, says, I shall delight in your statutes. I shall not forget your word. What does that mean? Now, statutes, I like the word boundary, so I would put it in, right? I will delight. The word delight, take, take delight, or you would say, um, uh, take time to focus, right? You would spend time to occupy yourselves with the boundaries of God. And then he says, I shall not forget. Uh, so he says, do not, do not, uh, do not let me forget. Uh, do not, 
Uh, I would not want to, well, the word forget, how should you say? The word forget literally means ignore. It also means to misplace. It also means to uh, not remember. This is a contrast to verse 11. Your words have I treasured or I hid in my heart that I may not sin against you. And the whole idea here is you would treat God's word as gold, as riches. And so you do not want to forget or ignore and, and misplace God's words. And that is what this word, this phrase actually means. I, I shall not misplace your words, which is very precious. I will take time to focus on your boundaries. And so in all that we have seen in all eight verses is a very action-oriented focus with an attitude not to misplace, but with an attitude to make sure we walk right by God, to keep our ways pure, to walk rightly before God, that we do not sin against God or we miss doing certain things that God has said. That's what sin actually means. And so in these eight verses, I would say that our attitude is important. Our actions are important to know God's word so that we walk correctly, that our choices is correct. Our minds are filled with the precepts and mandate of God so that when you know that you have to make a decision, you know what God wants us to do. We always ask, what is God's will? What is God's will? Psalm 119 tells us that God's will is what God wants us to do. It's as simple as that. It is to give us the principles of life to guide us so that we do not forget God's words. We do not walk away or we make choices that is contrary to God's words. That, that's basically how this segment of eight verses is telling us. And, and we are very familiar with many of the verses, but the Hebrew itself breaks it down to a very practical level. If we praise God, we bless God, then we should ask God to teach us his words. Now, teaching us his words is not by accident as well. It is intentional. It is by careful reading, by careful studying, by careful using, by careful observing, by careful guarding. And his precepts, his commands, his mandates, his boundaries, his statutes, his words, his Torah, his instructions, they all mean the same thing. And so we are constantly in this chapter given a picture that on our left and right, as we journey this life's pathway, that we are holding on to the guideposts of God's words. That is how important it is. The moment we let go is the time that we are liable to walk away. And that's why the psalmist says, right? Your word have I hidden, I concealed so that I do not forget in my heart, in all my decisions that I may not sin against you. I do not want to make the unintentional error. I do not want to misplace or miss doing anything. How is our attitude towards God's word? I mean, we all love Psalm 119, but I think it is incumbent on us today, this evening, to consider how we value the word of God. That are we just making lip service or are we seriously contemplating, pondering, studying, knowing, looking at, inquiring, focusing, paying attention to? You see, all of these words are in the psalm itself. And, and thereby we 
are assured to walk right with God. And with this, we come to the end of verse 16.